I'm, I'm a physicist by training. Okay. But I've been a chess enthusiast, you know, since you know, I was probably nine or ten years old. Okay. Uh, I've played a little bit myself, but I, I found that, you know, in college, for example, I played for the college chess team. Um, and then uh, during my graduate studies, I played a little bit of uh, postal chess, but found that I, you know, I, it was taking too much energy. Uh, I'm a bit of perfectionist. And so I wanted all my postal games to be perfect. So I'd be spending days on every move. Okay. I played half a dozen games. I won all of them, but it was just taking far too much time. And so I've, you know, I've, I've sort of switched to computer chess as a hobby. Okay. Uh, and I got interested in, in end games in particular, maybe again, because of that perfectionist tendency. I want to see what the ultimate truth is in a position. Uh, and, and so probably the, the, the biggest results that, you know, are online for everyone is the work uh, Jakob Konoval and I, I did back in, in the mid-2000s uh, where we, uh, the first to solve, you know, seven-man in-games completely. And, and that, you know, we have a, a record position there that's also online. Book Bishop at Night that takes 517 moves to win. Um, you know, and, uh, and more recently, I've about a couple of years ago, I started thinking about eight man end games. Um, you know, very roughly, you know, this is a rule of thumb, I would say every 15 years or so, you can add another piece because every time you add another piece, computation goes up by a factor of 64, you know, and roughly that's what you see in computing power. So, uh, going up, so very roughly, it was time years. Uh, to. Wow. Roughly. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Schiller's work on, on six man in games was dates back to the late 80s, early 90s. And then Jakob and my work, you know, 2005 and then now 2020, you know, the, the eight man work. Okay. Have you um, solved them all or is it just a few positions? Because I saw some posts immediately just discussing some specific positions and not sort of like we solve them all and this is what we have. Yeah, we've definitely only solved a subset and, and, and two subsets. One, one, uh, you know, the first question I had was, are there going to be more record positions? You know, every time you add another piece, you know, you may recall for for six months, the record is about 240 moves. For seven months, it's uh, uh, about 500 moves. And so, so I spent a lot of time working on in games without pawns which have pretty much no practical value at all, right? It, I think there's almost no games at all that occur with eight pieces where there are no pawns involved. Okay, that's but fair. That was more of a, a theoretical question, okay. And, and my result is no. Basically, the, the moves seem to saturate at that point, the depth. Uh, and that was sort of the first post that's on that Arvis Vec website uh, that you saw where, you know, even though I haven't solved every single uh, pawnless configuration, there are many configurations, you know, for example, you know, six queens versus a rook and things like that. Right. You know, you don't expect anything. But all the ones that potentially could lead to a record I've looked at and I haven't found any. I actually understand completely. When I was uh, trying to uh, put on my computer the seven-piece set, now I know the full set is something like, over 15 ter you know, terabytes, it's just ridiculous. And I didn't have that kind of space. And I thought, well, do I really need all of this? And I did this survey of, you know, the frequency of the positions that appear in, let's just say, millions of games, you know, because obviously there are going to be some, like you said, that are just completely obviously useless. But there are others also that are just going to be so infrequent that it's not really going to be a factor in your analysis. And I've realized that actually with something like less than three terabytes, you were covering 95% of the positions that occurred with any kind of frequency. Because exactly. So again, the, the pawnless stuff was purely record hunting. You know, I thought, well, so far, the depth always doubled if you had another piece. And okay, I was almost a little disappointed when it didn't, you know, even though no records? Come on. Was the, the pioneer on, on the six-man work, 
he kind of had expected that saturation already to occur with seven pieces. So he was very surprised when we announced the five frame move uh, seven man result. But, you know, finally it looks at, at eight pieces, at least without pawns, we've reached that point. So then I turned to more practical endings, okay. endings with pawns. Um, and, you know, and the, the full universe of eight man endings would be ginormous. It would be on the order of petabyte. Um, so one, so that's, you know, and for, uh, I was trying to get, you know, maybe some support from Google or one of these big places that, that could be done. Okay. But, you know, obviously for a home computer kind of person like myself, that's just not achievable. But what we looked at uh, are subset of endings where there's at least one pair of opposing pawns. Okay. So, for example, a white pawn, pawn on A2 and a black pawn on A5. Uh, and we call those endings OP1, you know, denoting that there's at least one pair of opposing pawns. And the reason that's a much simpler set is that suppose you have, you know, just two pawns are opposing each other and the rest of the pieces are regular pieces like knights and bishops and ropes, etc. Then there can never be a promotion of one of these pawns unless there is a capture beforehand. Right, because the pawns are in each other's way. Okay. So I can solve that end game if I know all the sub games that can result from captures, by, which by definition are seven man in games which I already have. Okay. Okay. Makes now sense. suppose I have, uh, I add a pawn to this. So I have you know, my opposing pair, say on a2 and a5, uh, and I add a pawn at b2. In this case, right, there could be a promotion by that B pawn because, in theory, right, it could march all the way to the uh, other end, and you know, Black is not forced to capture it. Uh, but uh, even after promotion, we are still left with an OP1 ending because after the promotion, we'll have the two pawns and A2 and A5, and just pieces remaining. Okay. So a mathematician would say the OP1 set is closed. <laughs> when, if I start with an OP1 set, I'm always going to be in one. Fair. Uh, so the, the, the gist of all this long story is that about half of all positions that occur in practice with eight pieces are of OP1 type. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so that makes it, uh, while my guesstimate is that in terms of computational power, it takes probably a factor of 100 or so less to generate the OP1 endings than, it, uh, generate, than generating the full eight-man set. So it's a huge cost-benefit increase, right? Because right. I'm expending 100 times the computation to solve half all of all the interesting positions. If I define interesting positions as those that have, that have occurred in, in practical games. So so the, the longest, thing, and I, I, I like to my, measure my um, records in uh, a little technically in terms of reversible moves. It's, it's similar what's used for the 50 move rule. Uh, you know, the 50 move says if a, you know, the, the move count resets if there was a capture or pawn move, okay. because then you can't reverse, right? You can't move a pawn back right. and you can't uncapture a piece. Sure. Uh, and that's sort of a clean way of measuring whether progress is being made, right? If, if once you've reached uh, an irreversible move, which can include a capture or a checkmate or a pawn move, that's, a, in my mind, a cleaner way of measuring the depth of a position. Because checkmate, you can always end up putting artificial, you know, if, if someone says, okay, I have a mate in 10, right? I can go to that starting position and probably introduce some artificial captures force captures to make that longer than 10 moves. And that's why I prefer, you know, the An the artificial way of extension, the let's put it that way. Exactly. Okay. Um, and that, that sort of convention goes back to Ken Thompson, who kind of pioneered this whole field of uh, computer endgames. Did he? Anyway, so that <laughs> he, he did, yeah. Uh, and he's, of course more well known as as the father of the unix operating system a brilliant right that's why I, that's why i was kind of wondering you know 
Um, yeah. I mean, the the first uh, end game. Well, I mean, I wouldn't. It's obviously not table based. Um, let's say device or com uh, compute computational. And I'm not talking, of course, of the manual devices. I'm thinking um, of Shannon's device. He had one that I believe was electronically able to solve um, some uh, some end games. But yeah, and there there was some very early work. Uh, I think the first database was. Uh, I think King and Pawn against King. But what made Thompson famous is that he 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 developed the first database for Queen versus Rook. Okay. Uh, and he had had it play a test match against Walter Brown, who I think they played two games. In the first game, uh, Walter Brown was not able to win with the Queen against the Rook within the 50 move limit. Ah. In the second game, he did. Okay. So that was really sort of the, I would say, putting computer in games on the map. Wow, there's some stuff out there that's even going to give grandmasters a hard time. Right. Um, and then, of course, Ken Thompson went on to find other in games, you know, like, you know, uh, two bishops against knight, you know, proving that that's actually a general win, even though it can take over 60 moves to do it. And that sort of really got the ball rolling and me kind of interested in, in that field. Okay, and when was this? Uh, so I believe the, the the two bishops versus knight was in the early eighties. Okay, it's just to situate where you're where you came in, at least as an interested party. And, yeah, exactly. You know. I was still a you know a student in the, in those days, so I kind of uh, I read about it and I thought, wow, this is really cool, and and tried to, you know, I was a graduate student and I wasted some of my time that I should have been doing. My physics research on... <laughs> Haven't we all wasted it on something chess. or something? <laughs> chess is as bad so, as good as another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm, this is a long-winded to come back. No, it's, it's really interesting. I'm, 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 I tell you, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really following all of this. Don't worry about it. And I'm sure there will be others who, are, who will be watching this and who will think, okay, some people are like, ah, I'm going to... What's he talking about? Uh, skip forward uh, five minutes. When is he going to finish talking about this story? And others will be watching like me, you know, just very interested in following this history about the whole thing and the process and how it goes. And, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nerd at, um, uh, and chess player all the way down. And so, you know, every time I, you start talking about uh, numbers and chess and how these all work together, you're going to have my full interest. You know, so good. And I'm sure anyway, I'm coming back to your original question, what's the current record? Right. Yes. <laughs> and so I went on a long <laughs> detour on, OK, how you measure all the stuff. But the bottom line is that the, the latest record is uh, 484 moves. And that's in a kind of bizarre now? position. Pardon? It wasn't 584? Or was it 484? 584, yeah. OK. Because I saw it on the uh -huh. side. That's why I was just asking. Yeah. And that's, uh, uh, you know, there were two articles that uh, on on Arvis that I think you saw, and that's sort of got you started here, right? Yeah. One, the first one was purely on the pawn list stuff, showing okay, there's no new records there, and then the second one was the the, the start of looking at these OP1 endings. Right. Um, now, even with just one pairs of, of pawns, it's not a ton of games, but some interesting ones. For example. You know, Kaspar versus Karpov in one of the World Championships game games, they had a position uh, uh, with, uh, let's see, Rook Bishop and Pawn versus Bishop Knight and Pawn. Right. That were blocked on on, on one file. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's uh, that was the second article, and particularly focusing just Which on one. Which Kasparov converted quite efficiently. Uh, per he, your words. He, he converted, and and my program actually said he did a pretty good job. Um, you know, this this ending has occurred in, in a number of other Grandmaster games, and in some cases, people were not able to convert. So it's, it's complex. Just out of curiosity, um, just as a side point, do you know if he actually adjourned before actually resuming this particular position? I mean, did he have time to analyze it and therefore? come back all prepped and ready or was he just continuing the game and he just solved it at the board you know uh, with his uh, pure skill and ability <laughs> it's a very good question it's a, it's a good historical question my 
I, I don't remember. Uh, I'm so just curious that, because, I mean, we all know he, how, I mean, it was 1990. So obviously he wasn't going to be able to rely on uh, supercomputers or databases yeah, yeah. or whatever to do that. But he had, of course, he also had a team of analysts. And because of the world championship, he would have those, a really elite team. Uh, and his memory, of course, is legendary. So if he had had time to, let's say, analyze this with his team and let them work on it and come back with him and explain all the methods, then it would be very surprising if he didn't win it efficiently. But if, on the other hand, he was just at the board and just, you know, you have to solve this and, you know, deal with it, then, wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, my... Of course, I prefer to think that he solved it at the board. Uh, we all prefer that, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's the 1990s, and you know, but obviously th we can these things check, existed, you know? right? So, Karpov defended pretty well too. Yeah. So you know, uh, because again, there were a number of other Grandmaster games where people had trouble, and, and even some where people were not able to convert. Uh, now, this is a position where even the starting position was not that far from the win. But there are some where it takes 400 moves, so obviously, you know, well beyond what anybody's could be done. willing to play at the board, much less Thing actually be to able play. to win it. And obviously, the 50 move people would hopefully hang out for 50 moves, and then it'd be a draw, and, yeah. and everybody can go to the bar, basically. So. <laughs> fair, fair. Anyway, so again, long-winded detour, so that the record position is a bit of an obscure position. It has one pair of opposing pawns. Uh, and then a rook and two equal colored bishops versus the queen. So really, really bizarre. You know, it will never occur at all. Okay. But it is the record position right now. Yeah, it has that merit and we have to, you know, bow our heads and say, this is the record position. This is the record position. Doesn't matter what we think about it. <laughs> yeah, again, it's, it's the theoretical position. Um, you know, and that's where we are right now in terms of records, at least. So were there, any, were there any interesting discoveries? Because, I mean, one of the things that every, let's say, new iteration of the table bases um, have brought has been some kind of, at least in some positions, um, some discoveries, some unveiling, something that thinks we, or we thought, oh, really, that, that wins or we can win this way. Or we thought that, you know, have, have, there's, have there been anything that comes to mind? There are a few things. I mean, one of the reasons we haven't published more is that because it's just there's a lot of data to kind of go through. Um, how, I think how, how big? How I mean, yeah, you've, you've solved, let's say, what is it, 50 percent of them or. I've, I've solved all endings of OP1 type. OK, so, so that's like 50, you said that was like about 50 percent of them, if I understood. That's that. very, very roughly in terms of practical positions out there. That's 50 percent of all eight man positions that have occurred. Okay. Um, so it's, in just, that it's, sense, just, it's just to get, it's just to get a, a reference. Um, so my question therefore is how much space does that take up? Because I had a discussion with, uh, 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 Elizabeth uh, Petz and she was talking about, Oh, but can we one day solve chess and whatever? And I said, look, it doesn't matter if we have the greatest quantum computers in the world able to calculate every position. Even if we had that possibility, there's no way to store it. So it's irrelevant. Uh, it becomes sort of, you know, what comes with first, the chicken or the egg kind of question. It doesn't matter because even if you had the capability of solving it, there's nowhere you can put it. So it's, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a question that really has any practical sense, even if theoretically you could come up with one. Um, and I know, obviously, that was, we're talking, of course, you know, the full 32-piece database, a table-based situation. But here, where we're still at eight, and I know that already nine was something like, what was it like? I think it, even with the, um, the Syzygy, it was something like uh, 17 or, or, or 18 terabytes um, with the, the WDL um, and the DTZ. WDL meaning win, draw, loss, and DTZ is uh, uh, the number of moves. Uh, left. So, you know, how, how, how big is it now? So the, the complete OP1 data set is about 70 terabytes. Wow. Okay. Uh, Still which huge. Which very roughly divides into, because I store both white to move and black to move. Okay. Uh, for ease of analysis. Now, for example, uh, you know, Syzygy doesn't. Um, they can save a little 
space like that because if you don't have the black to move well, you have the white to move, you just have to look at one move ahead, just look at all those moves and you know, you cover the black to move. So it's okay. it's so so Syzygy was really concerned with really minimizing the possible space. Okay. In my case, it's more at this point more of a research tool, so I wasn't quite as but seventy terabytes is certainly a very manageable number. No, it, it uh, is. It's, it, and it's more than I can possibly have, but it is actually conceivable to imagine somebody with resources owning that kind of uh, space because, you know, the drive, yeah. hard drives and SSDs have grown exponentially. There are now, I believe, 15 terabyte uh, SSDs alone, never mind, you know, exactly. physical hard drives. All right. Uh, I know we were talking a little bit more practical uh, positions, uh, you know, and where the new results. So right now we have just a ton of data. And, you know, we basically looked at all eight-man positions that can be solved uh, that are in, in things like a chess-based database or in like our Bach's endgame manual in various places. Right. And there is a ton of interesting stuff, you know, a ton of, a ton of mistakes people make. Um, and at this point, we're sort of looking at, you know, what are sort of interesting things? You know, there's obviously lots of things people blunder and it's not very interesting versus, wow, there's some new theory that potentially could be, you know, interesting. And, and that's still kind of work in progress a little bit. Uh, you, you know, there's this very famous uh, Grandmaster Robert Hubner, right, who was famous for his exhaustive analysis. Um, but nevertheless, he missed a few things in some some cases, you know. In his analysis so or in his games? Some, uh, analysis. Okay. Yeah, not, not the games, but his analysis. You know, uh, and so there's a, a, certainly some interesting examples that are fairly accessible in addition to some of the record uh, the type stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, how did you come by this uh, following these particular positions by Hubner? Uh, I'm just wondering how they came into your radar, so to speak, uh, for you to uh, submit to your table-based solutions. Yeah. Uh, some of them are just in... Uh, the chess-based mega database. For example, okay. you know, one one game. There's a, a famous game, Karish versus Levenfish, I think. Oh. Uh, that has been it's it's a, sort of a classic, and it's been in the Auerbach end game books. So a lot of people who are interested in this position. Karish spent quite a bit of time on it, uh, and then Huber so looked at that analysis and tried to improve on it. Um, so there's a, and that's captured in the annotation to that game in the chess space mega database. Okay. When, so we when, have it, when did he analyze this? I'm just curious, just to understand what kind of resources he had to. Uh, uh, yeah, this is probably a while ago. My guess is 80s. Uh, so certainly before before some of the more powerful engines available. Table base options yeah. are. Okay, no, I was just curious. And, and so, no, it's not that he was a bad analyst. And, and no, clearly of course today not. he would probably you know, he'd have to stock fish and he'd find some of this pretty quickly, but more just to sort of put context around what can be done with, because obviously with the database, you get the answer instantaneously. You don't have to turn on stock fish and, you know, run it for a while and you just get the, the answer instantaneously. Right, right, right. Uh, so how much do you think this is an advanced uh, uh, chess endgame theory, um, you know, the table bases? Obviously, the three, four pieces, we had them down. That wasn't a problem. And probably many of the five, I won't say all of them because it's hard to say. I remember this book by John Nunn. Um, on, uh, he called them Rook Endings. And I remember looking at this book by Batsford. It was this huge brick. And I walked, walked into this uh, chess bookstore, and I opened it up, and I thought, you're kidding me. This is like 400 pages, or I don't remember how many, but it was really huge, uh, of analysis of only Rook and pawn versus king and yeah. rook. And I thought, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And, and uh, I think, you know, I think there's a great saying, chess is 99% tactics. Uh, you know, what I, you know, how I apply this to in-game theory is that there's very little general theory. You very quickly get into tactical stuff. Um, I think some of the interesting, more theoretic, still theoretical results, but for example, you know, the, what, what Yakov Konoval and I discovered 15 years ago is that rook and two minor pieces 
pretty much always win against Rock in a minor piece. Um, you know, that that's, again, that doesn't happen too often, but it's one result where, say, in-game theory really was advanced by the computer. Okay. A lot of these eight-man positions, okay, we've got the record positions, but, for example, Rook and three pawns versus Rook and pawn, right? Sometimes it's a win, sometimes it's not. Uh, you know, obviously, we now have the database to, at least in the case where, where the pawn is uh, is opposing uh, another one, we can solve completely, but I'm not sure we'll be able to extract sort of a general theory from that. Okay, under these a, B in circumstances, the three pawns always win against the lone pawn. Uh, I think that's going to be very difficult. Um, I'm hoping we can at least come up with some more general insights. Um, another area I that would be fascinated be... to hear about that. I mean, <laughs> no, because yeah. I mean, obviously, everyone will assume that the three pawns will win. So the real question uh, to players on a practical sense will be to nail down and hopefully generalize the conditions when they don't win. Now, like, okay, exactly. We, I expect them and, to win, but that's, when does it not win? And when will the defensive exactly. side who knows this will go like, <laughs> the poor, sweet poor. Other, other cases know, where, where we might make some progress is certain fortress type positions. You know, I think Magnus Carlsen is famous for saying that there are no fortresses. Um, now with the computer, we can kind of confirm that, right? Okay. Maybe there's a fortress, maybe not. We, we know the exact answer. And some of these endings are a little more obscure. For example, queen and two pawns versus rook, bishop, and pawn. I think that just adding material, you know, the queen would have a slight advantage. Um, and indeed, she wins many positions, but they're also fortress positions. And so with, with this uh, database, we can look at that exactly. Other uh, famous endings that we now solve exactly are rook and two pawns versus bishop and two pawns, where the pawns are, you know, on the same, like both have an A and B pawn, um, and one has a rook versus a bishop. Right. Um, a lot of the, you know, people have looked at these endings with other tools, and the theory is pretty well developed, but now with our database, because the special case of OP1 endings, we know the complete answer. So we could make sure that we have the final say, okay, if, you know, if the, the pawns have are in the corner with the bishop and the light squares versus, you know, we can, we can basically try and come up with a more general explanation of, of the current theory. Okay. Okay. Again, all this is still work in progress. And that's why we haven't really published anything since these articles in on, on Arvis because it's it's kind of hard to come up with a digestible way of of explaining all this information. Look, I think you, you did a great job, and I mean honestly, at this stage, it will be a, a very interest to a lot of people. Just you know, some of the the, the challenges involved. It's not necessarily uh, the classification specifically. Some people will probably gloss over that and. It's okay. Uh, but some will certainly be interested in knowing, like, how much spaces can we expect this to take up at some stage? Because as this becomes, let's say, more and more uh, feasible for your enthusiasts, uh, there will be some who will be willing to invest in the hardware to try to store that kind of data and maybe help produce it as well. Um, and, you know, it's always something we'll be consulting. It will, how much space does it take? How long does it work? Uh, tell me, you. Can you benefit, would you benefit from, let's say, people helping you with this sort of work? Yeah, I think that would definitely, especially if, if, if there's interest in trying to come up with some kind of server that, you know, makes these positions available, like they, they exist for um, Syzygy, right? right. Uh, you know, they can make it available and very generous, right? You can download it, you can also access it. If you don't want to download it, you can submit a position, right? And it, it gives you the answer. And, and I think something like that is probably feasible for the OP1 data. And that's something, you know, I personally don't have the resources to make that available. How much would the but full eight pace take up? Just out of, uh, just to understand. Yeah, my own guesstimate would be a hundred times as much. So I think that's, you know, <laughs> 
Sorry. Uh, you know, that's <laughs> that took the breath out of me there. <laughs> and that's why I think the OP1 is, is so interesting. It's, 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 like I said, roughly half of all interesting positions, um, but a hundredth of the space. So right. uh, I think it's a great trade-off. No, it is. It is. It's uh, just because at some point, obviously, once you finish with what the e the easy, the easy stuff, you're going to have to start dealing with the real meat of it, um, like it or not. <laughs> just to say we did it all, and I'm just trying to understand what that entails. Yeah, I know there's always been rumors about you know the Lomonosov uh, folks who've done, they've done you know, uh, in 2012 they they computed all the seven man. Uh, endings distance to mate so that's right. about seven years after Konoval and my work um, and there was always rumor that they were working on eight man and solving them completely oh yeah I didn't hear you about know, that one um, that was uh, it's been rumors that have been going around for a few years and maybe they just kind of had trouble getting the funding for this kind of massive you know complete effort um, so what's your, what's your, what's the next step? What's your, what are your plans? Uh, do you plan to continue to pursue this on your own? Are you trying to enlist the help of others? Will you be setting up some kind of distribution project or are you considering it? Yeah, I think, I think at this point from a computational perspective, we're kind of taking a pause. It's really more about, and so we're working with folks like Karsten Mueller, right? Who's as, as you know, a well, well-known in-game authority. Um, kind of work with him a little bit to see how do we make sense of all this data? What do we do? Um, so that's really what we're working on now, uh, more so than, you know, the computational piece of it um, at this point, at least. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Well, Mark, I want to thank you for uh, lending so much of your time to uh, share um, your discoveries and uh, all of this information, which is certainly going to take some time to digest. Um, and uh, I thank you for fighting the good fight because I know you've been at it for so long, um, <laughs> helping, helping advance the knowledge of chess through the table bases. And uh, that's not an inconsiderable uh, feat, um, particularly because I get the impression that this is, well, I won't say it's a one-man operation, but it's not a big team and it's certainly not a, uh, multinational backed uh, effort uh, like the Lomonosov or what? Yeah, it's been definitely, you know, the, like working in a hacking in a garage kind of uh, kind of thing, um, you know. But I mean, it, it, it's interesting that, you know, the seven man stuff that Yakov and I did, you know, back in 2005, it took almost 15 years for that to become really mainstream. Yeah, this um, is true. You know, and, and so, unless we you know, there's some significant I think I only backing of the really eight man. It's going to probably take as much time, uh, you know, for that to become a mainstream as well. Except maybe for the OP1 stuff, which I think is is, is certainly is, is certainly more accessible now, at least in in, in principle. Uh, the thing I have to be I'm I'm trying to get in my head is that okay in the last let's say couple of years I was when I made the big effort to sort of get and, and, and condense and, and choose uh, even three terabytes worth of table basis in terms of the seven pieces. And that was, you know, now you're telling me it's going to be 64 times. So I'm trying to imagine uh, myself in 15 years. <laughs> um, yeah, just, yeah, I just stored it in my 200 terabytes of what have you, a hard drive. And I'm just thinking right now that just sounds completely crazy. And, I'll, and, maybe, and of course, in 15 years, I'll be laughing at all of this. It's like, it's just 200 terabytes. What are you talking about? Exactly. You know, Mark, my friend. Um, so again, once again, I want to thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak with me and to the uh, viewers um, about your findings in the eight-piece uh, table bases. And... It's been really a, a very interesting and an enlightening uh, discussion.